want to have Doc White come or Dr. Perosa come, you know, somebody with a brain. No, we want the dumb grunt. So yeah, that's what you're getting today. What I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of go over uh, a system in terms of health on board a vessel. Now, it's really apparent, you know, for certain areas like maybe oil rigs or cruise ships, you see them in the news all the time. But it's gonna, you're going to see other applications because everything that I'm discussing here is also going to work in terms of your primary problem, which is mold. So it it's a, it's a, ends up being a double-edged sword, but you're going to hear me talking about health. So right now in this room, we got a whole bunch of people. And in the last hour, everybody in this room has shed somewhere between 38 and 45 million particles, be it bacteria or fungus. So your mere existence is polluting this space like nobody's business, that y'all feel bad. So you're sitting there thinking, how, if we're shedding like this, how can disinfection keep it clean? Because what do they do? They come up and spray it, and they immediately wipe it. Well, there's a dwell time for that. I think you've heard about it, but you never, ever see anybody spray it, walk away, and come back. Oh, it dried, spray it again. They don't put the 10 minutes on it. And what that does is it tends to inoculate either fungus or bacteria, and it gives it what we call a sublethal dose. So it turns it into a food source. So that last big oil spill in the Gulf, what did they do to get rid of that? Anybody know? That's it. So they took bacteria, trained it to eat this stuff because it will eat anything. If you've got a HEPA filter and you've got bacteria that gets caught in that HEPA filter, it turns it into a food source. It'll, the stuff will eat literally anything. So we work in clean rooms and the guy goes, well, I go, when did you change your HEPA filter last? Well, we have never gotten to the point where we've gotten enough resistance in there to change it. So you're saying years. Mm -hmm. So the bacteria gets in there, starts feeding, and it literally grows through it and shoots out the back end. It's the weirdest thing because here's a, here's a group that physically gets measured on their job. And if they go out of, of status, you're talking millions of dollars. They're going to get shut down by the government and they can lose millions of dollars a day, depending on the size, could be only 100,000 a day. They don't change a $700 HEPA, it's just dumb. So we're talking preventative, we're talking biology that adapts. They're just like you, if I've tried to kill anybody in this room, they are going to adapt and ensure that that doesn't happen. These little bugs do the exact same thing and they're gonna strive to stay alive. At that same point in time, they're constantly mutating. So you've, everybody's heard of antimicrobial resistance, right? And that's basically, we take an antibiotic and the bugs that are inside us start to get used to it. And they morph so that they can combat that antibiotic. But nature does it too. So air pollution, Bacteria and fungus dealing with air pollution are also morphing. They just had a cave that they opened up out in the Arizona desert. No man had been in this cave for millions of years. They went in, swabbed it, came out with all kinds of current antibiotic resistant bacteria. Well, nobody in there is eating bacteria. No, but you've got different things in that environment that are forcing that bacteria to change and it accidentally changed into something that this antibiotic wouldn't work against or this medicine wouldn't work against. So this is something that's habitual, it constantly happens, and it ends up being a significant issue in terms of health. Because what we do is we create the antibiotic or the medicine to help, and it can get outdated fairly quickly. And it really gets outdated if we end up overusing the antibiotics. So all that mutation, all that change, you get underway on, on a vessel. And the older ships had a lot of people on them. Newer ships, so I understand it, have fewer people on them. 
Well, Fox just came out with a piece on small business. You know, when somebody's sick, it really puts a lot of pain on that company. When your best guy is not there, holy cow, you really get a sense for what they're worth. Well, if your engineer's down and you're at sea and you're in a storm, oh, you got a problem again. So that health piece we think is vital. I think it's vital for everybody that we deal with and you're gonna, we're gonna walk through it. So it ties into biosecurity and a few other elements. So let me find a little clicker. Let's see if I can get the right button. The down arrow. So anybody heard of this novel coronavirus? About, and I, this is, I'm gonna just tell you, I think it's 100% speculation, but it's a great story because it ties to maritime. The first big coronavirus that popped was SARS. The next one that popped, and they happened almost simultaneously, was MERS and PEDV. PEDV impacted the hog industry. Now, you guys don't deal with hogs. You probably had no clue it was happening, but it's a coronavirus. What it did was made your bacon costs go straight up. So if you're a bacon eater, you might have noticed a spike in the food. All of these coronaviruses were absolutely pulled out and they sorted them out and they found out they were all airborne. Well, nobody wants to tell you this, but any particle that's 0.3 microns in size or smaller has the ability to be permanently suspended in the air. It's not coming out of the air unless it gets moved into a surface. So it could just sit in the air for days, weeks, months. It, you know, it's gonna move as air currents hit it, but it's, it's under browning in motion, so it doesn't have gravity really forcing it down. So you got all these particles uh, in the air, and the CDC and most governments tell you, oh, nothing's airborne. Well, the, the reality is virtually everything's airborne. And they, they say it because we're too stupid to, deal with real facts. We'll panic. The world will come to an end. I don't think so. You're just going to realize it and do the best you can to mitigate that fact. The average human sucks in about 10 million mold spores a day. Just living. It's kind of like you're shedding 40 some million. Well, you're sucking that in and somehow your immune system just takes care of it. But when you've got people that are, have a compromised system, there's ways to, what I would say, control it. And we're gonna kind of go through that a little bit. So this PEDV virus, why that ties back in, is they ended up swabbing some shipping container webbing. And they basically found that the, the virus made it to the US and infected our hog population off of these things and it just moved from there. Now viruses aren't alive, they're either active or inactive, but at the same time, here's a piece where you had a virus on board a ship, made it across on an inanimate object, somehow through the port system made contact, got tied into other aspects of it. And it was normally tied to uh, pig food and it made it out into the farms. Well, the University of Minnesota did a nice study on this, and they took a series of barns, and they put some of them under submicron filtration, like a MERV-14, an electrostatic filter, HEPA filters, different types. And then they had one control barn with nothing, and then they inoculated the area and it had PEDV in it and the control barn had deaths and the filtered barn didn't have deaths. They tracked with sensors around the thing as far out as 18 kilometers. So the thought that stuff isn't airborne is kind of nuts. There's a, there's a disease called Kawasaki's disease. 
it impacts the heart. There's a doctor, Kawasaki, in Japan that annotated this completely. There was an epidemiologist from Denver that shows up and sat down with this doc. And she, she was working through all their numbers and it was so detailed that she said, you know, there's a NOAA scientist here. And they linked it up with weather patterns. And it was so accurate that they were able to trace the source of the wind coming out of Mongolia. And then whenever this happened, you got these Kawasaki infections. And then from, it was hit in Japan, and then they were able to also track it to the west coast of the US and to where she lived in Denver, just using air patterns. Well, the air, whatever it was, got up in the troposphere, they freeze dried it, brought it across the ocean, dropped it, it dries out, it gets some moisture in it, comes back, and we've got a disease that's airborne. So what we're, what we're saying is you've got a very dynamic environment. Bacteria, virus, fungus move through water. They move through air. They move in our, in, a, in our body and on our skin, on our clothes, and we end up having to deal with that. Let's see. The down arrow. So how do you compete? Well, the first thing we do is we want a hand hygiene program. Oh, that's tough, right? So what we end up doing is that molecule that you saw on the thing, we, we put it into a hand sanitizer and your hands will remain fairly clean all day long. I touch this, I get a little bit of transfer, but it's constantly reducing anything that's on the hands. Almost every major study that's out there that says if you have a good hand hygiene protocol, you're going to reduce illness rates by 20%. So any business that would, would be receptive to it, and that's almost no cost for hand sanitizer, right? Why wouldn't you do it? The problem is regular hand sanitizer, you got to put it on. This is a one-time application type piece. That molecule will attach to your skin, and it comes off if you've abraded it off. And that's not merely washing your hands, that's almost like sanding it off. So you wanna take skin off to get rid of it. Clean surfaces, fungus, virus, all these bugs will harbor in clothing, on desks, keyboards, any surface. And if we, we wanna inoculate it, we wanna keep those clean. There are three theories out there that I've seen, and there's probably gonna be more. One's called the hygiene and, uh, hypothesis. It's where we've gotten too clean. And since we're so clean, more asthmas happen, more. <clears throat> that one has been completely observational, and I'm sure there's aspects to it, may, may be right, but it's probably the least likely. There's another one that's tied to um, your microbiome is comes from your mother at birth so you've got a vertical transmission from mother and then the third one is it's tied to the food you eat well scientists always try to get it really really specific so they narrow the topic it's really going to be kind of all of them so environment's going to have an impact and, and we know it because we've just talked about it we've talked about ted v making it across the ocean in a vessel and wiping out the US Canadian hog population for about three years. We've talked about this coronavirus. It's now making it across in, in the air. I'll bet you can make it across in a vessel. How many times have you seen grain come in and the outside of it is all contaminated based on, so all this stuff happens, it happens from surface, air, water, all of it, and we've got to figure out how to fix it. I think the other thing that's unique in terms of an underway scenario is you don't have a lot of uh, time that's not where you're working. If you're on a ship and you're, you're working, unless you're in the Marines and then you're working out and watching all the Navy guys work 18 hours a day. So they've got a limited resource to do all of this cleaning. And, they, and because of that, we're saying that the focus needs to really move to 
persistent cleaning technologies. There's a number of them out there. There's ours, there's a product called titanium dioxide, copper. These things will continually reduce um, bacteria, fungus, virus on a surface, keeping you safe. All of them have pros and cons. And that's, you know, we like ours, of course, but you know, there's a lot of different pros and cons to all of them. I got a, I first got attached to this molecule about 15 years ago, and I looked at it as the US getting involved with overseas where you could go in and treat clinics. Some of them look like Auschwitz death chambers, and but it's an OB clinic blood everywhere, rusted stuff. And I thought, man, you could just spray this and we could probably cut down on infections a lot. It'd be a low cost way, but you could create jobs. You know, I was kind of rolling through my little pea brain in terms of how to make it work. We have found that this will work in virtually every industry. Your industry is much more focused on mold, but as I said, depending on where you're at, that human element comes into play. So like if you get on an oil rig, you get on a cruise ship, you get, what is it? Every other week you hear about a cruise ship coming back in with a norovirus. So it is kind of what it is. So biology also degrades equipment. Anybody ever seen biology get on a surface and start eating it? You end up with rust, you end up with degradation. So you can, you can by treating the surfaces, uh, add life to it. Biofilms on coils, you want to turn around and drive up the cost of energy. You get a good biofilm formed on a coil and you've got, <clears throat> it takes three times the energy to get through it. And as you get to about four or five, that's when the whole thing just stops working. But that's a cost. And for every business, there's a, there's a factor. You're running fuel oil to get that. You're burning it. It's just one more cost. Again, you've got barnacles. It just, it's a bigger, it's not, it's a bigger form of life, but it's same, same thing. So you've got limited resources <clears throat> and you want to focus on this persistence. So again, let's, let's keep, keep looking at persistent technologies. <clears throat> Where does it fit? Containers, grain storage, cargo holds, staterooms. It's everywhere. Our molecule has got food safe contact. The label says it can be put on a water filter. <clears throat> you can run water through it and drink it. It can be put on cut cutlery. It can be put on your dishes. It's got a 40 year history with no litigation against it. And God knows if you live in the US, we want to litigate everything, right? You know, who hasn't had somebody come after him with a lawyer? You haven't? Yeah. Give it time. Give it time. You can have a fender bender, it doesn't matter what, somebody's gonna, we cheat them in house coming, coming for you. So, <clears throat> All of these spaces work. Uh, we've gone into oil rigs in the past and you can change health outcomes. In the Gulf, they, once it gets, once the medic on site isn't comfortable, they've got to medevac that guy. <clears throat> and the helicopter coming out to get him and going back, it's a huge expense. So this, this type of technology uh, ends up keeping people safe. And what's really nice about it is it doesn't really depend on the people to have to do something. It's like the Legionella, you know, they got to go up and clean the uh, containers. They got to disinfect it. They've got to do all these things. All of this stuff is working persistently. Right? Go ahead. Is 
there's so much that moves. I mean, just in terms of like looking for nukes and bad things like that, less than 1% really get looked at. And to, to turn around and get to a biological level, and we're talking scale here, right? So way smaller than a pinhead, and this is what we're looking for? It's not, not really possible. So it, stuff gets alerted, like right now, everything that's coming out of Wuhan, China, is suspect. Uh, they're looking at the people that are flying. Did they have contact in Wuhan? And they just had one that wasn't in contact, but now has the coronavirus, so it transmitted somewhere else. The good news is, is this coronavirus isn't very deadly. It just gets old farts like me. I think that's the issue. When you're about 60 or above, you're, you're, that's where the threat is. It's not like MERS. It's not like SARS with a super high <clears throat> kill rate. Again, we've got this limited resource. We need biological security for all of this stuff. CLADX is, that's the next flu. That's what the government's been looking at where, where you were, it was discussed. It's that next super bug that's gonna come in and wipe everybody out. So we talked about disinfection and it works. It works fairly well if you're rotating it because if you use the same thing every time, it turns into a food source. Uh, Lysol kills germs on contact. There's a guy overseas that trained, took the original formula, put it on YouTube, and fed it to bacteria, and it, he showed the growth. He got a seven-figure seven deal from Lysol to pull that thing down. <laughs> Episodic cleaning helps. It absolutely helps, but how do you keep up with the level of shedding it? You know the old uh, cartoon where you had pig pen? So I'm pig pen. I got that cloud of yuck coming around and you don't necessarily know it. UV is a nice technology. Um, UVA used to work real well. Let's see, there was a little adaption. So they went to UVB. There's a little bit of adaption there. So now they're at UVC and that's always gonna work. Yeah, maybe. Well, UVC is out there. It's a great technology, but it's just like a disinfectant. When the light's on, it works. And when it goes off, it doesn't. So you want, with that lack of persistence, when you're in an underway a scenario or you're at the dock and you're fighting mold, you want the thing to continue working. There's a lot of different technologies. Copper's probably the oldest one. You know, that people did money that way, so germs didn't get transferred. TiO2, tremendous technology. Uh, titanium dioxide, it's a persistent agent. Um, it has to have light on it to work, so it won't work in a dark space. Uh, it's not, as of right now, I still don't know of any of that have EPA regulation that's done it by small groups. Doesn't mean it doesn't work. It just means it hasn't made it into uh, regulation. There's a company called Delos and they've created a well building piece and they're using this technology, but they recognized it as a shortcoming. So they put heavy, <laughs> heavy metals into it, which kind of de degrades from what it does. There's another tech, uh, technology out there called Sharklet, and they've mimicked shark skin, because if you swab a shark, there is no bacteria or fungus on it, so it won't allow it to adhere, and it sheds. So wherever you've got that, it's constantly shedding it. So it's gonna shed it to the floor, <laughs> some of their location that you're still gonna have to deal with it. <clears throat> All of these, have a place you just got to figure out where they're going to work for you. I think the side piece that I, when I got involved with it is, um, I looked to, to find technologies that had the least impact on the environment and human health. And I, uh, when I sat down with Dr. White, who brought this into the industry almost 40 years ago, Doc's in his seventies now, he's in better shape than I am. Uh, 
he, he kind of walked through this and the fact that it wasn't litigated against him. And I was pretty well sold in the last, on the 19th of December, we, we, we moved to a food, direct food contact piece. So you, that there aren't a lot of those out there. This stuff can go in a duct le legally. Most disinfection systems have to be on the label to go in. So this stuff has, if you've got a, a piece you can call and we can tell you if it will work legally or not, but it has a spot almost everywhere. And then once it's on the surface, you kind of saw it in the ad, that surface cleans way easier. Yeah, that positive charge doesn't allow things to kind of just stick to the surface. It's constantly repelling it. So now we're gonna to go to air. There are three ways that you can deal with air. You can dilute it. That means you bring in more air from the outside. We'll go to London. <laughs> you're bringing in more polluted air and you bring it right into the house. Most of the industry doesn't necessarily think that fresh air from the outside coming in works. A lot of these big boats uh, put off a huge amount of pollution. UVC, so you can put UVC into ductwork and you can work against biology. You're not working against particulate, but you can work against biology. So if you're in a duct, you can have one section of the duct moving at five or 600 lineal feet and you can have another one at 200. So it's just like water, it's at multiple speeds. So it's really hard to engineer it, but you can engineer and it works. Then you gotta get in there and clean those bulbs. Uh, and UVC, it works really well, but it is harmful to people. So you gotta make sure that it, it, it doesn't get out of the duct. And so there's more labor, which ends up being an issue when you're at sea. And the last one is filtration. Filtration is just putting something in the path that's, that's collecting it. And that's what, what I'm gonna talk to you about. So biosecurity or infection control is really about layers. If you just do one, you don't have the same impact as when you, when you do all of them. When I went to the, I took the kids out to a scout camp for a week and I treated my uniform before I went out. I sweated through the uniform three times a day morning, the afternoon, and then at night we'd go do something. But the fun never stopped. So <laughs> when I came back after wearing this thing for a week, like if I came out like this and sniffed, it wasn't pleasant. But the clothing, once it was removed, didn't smell. You can put this into your uniforms, your natural uniform, and it will help protect you from biology. These layers, coming across will protect the maritime, the merchant Marines, it'll protect uh, cruise line members, it'll protect almost anybody that's in there. There's nothing that will defeat everything because of the scale again. You know, you can still get somebody sick, but this gives you a huge, huge advantage. The focus on fixing this technology has really got to move to persistent technology, something that's working constantly because, well, we're shedding constantly. And, it, and to think that, you know, I'm gonna wipe down this surface once and it's gonna work is, I think we're dreaming. We're all smoking something. The last piece we don't wanna do is create a new problem. So, some of our oxidizers that are out there right now, when they get used, and this is the air, air arena is quite nascent, but oxidizers will take whatever that was and move it to something else. And that something else at times they're finding is harmful to humans. Now, I still don't panic about it because the scale of the testing is small. It's just an indicator kind of going forward. But when we look at technologies in our business and apply them, we're looking at the things that are the safest for our customers. So to fix that problem, we've got to work in the dark, we've got to work in the light, we've got to work persistently 24 hours a day, seven days a week.
Uh, having our food contact label allows us to move into a lot, lot of new places. We just got called into a pharmacy that they lost $30 million worth of drugs that were running through a plastic tube that all got contaminated. And we're going in to fix that next. So I'm going to show you filtration. Almost everything you've got on a ship is low flow. I think you can get into some of the larger ones that have larger restaurants on them and stuff that have higher flow. And this filter can configure for that but the low flow is predominantly the standard. So what I'm gonna do, can I get somebody to come up and validate what's going on here? One person. Okay. Okay. So what we've got here is just a box. It's got a filter. A, a grate on it on this side and it's got a computer fan. So it's not set to offset any kind of static pressure or anything like that. So we've turned the computer fan on and we're gonna turn on a laser particle counter that's gonna start looking at the air and it's gonna give us particles per cubic foot. This is this is from, um, we had this modified. So this actually goes down to uh, 0.3 microns in size. It's not the normal one from Dylos. And this is what the EPA uses for environmental testing. It's a nice little system. So right now, the numbers on the left are the small numbers. So that's 0.3 up to one micron. And the ones on the right are the large size particles and that's one micron and up. So it's, it's clustering them in groups. Can you tell them what the readings are? 101 and 18. So 101, you add three zeros to it. So you got 101,000 particles per cubic foot. And what I'm gonna tell you is that is clean air. So we're gonna take a filter. This is I think what's considered to be the best MERV 6 on the market. Now the filter industry is filled with liars, cheats, and thieves. I'm, I'm just being blatantly honest with you. I walked into a clean room that was paying $90 for a pre-filter. I pulled on it and I started pulling on it and it just came apart. Sold them furniture padding. A good filter has a binding in it. And when you pull, it doesn't pull apart. If you got furniture padding, it, they're selling it to you. And they're telling you it's a MERV, whatever, it's nothing. So this, is, this one's made by Superior and it's probably the best dust catching one we got. So we're gonna put it on this box and we're gonna get a sense for what it does for the air. And, and what I want you to do is tell them if the numbers really start going down or make any violent changes. Large numbers are going down rapidly from 18 to six. Okay, and how's submicron? Submicron is not changing much. Yeah, it actually looks like it went up. <laughs> dirty hands. It was your dirty hands. Absolutely. So I'm gonna, this is a HEPA filter. What's that feel like? I think it feels a little bit like a diaper. <laughs> HEPA filter, we're gonna put it on a computer fan and we'll see what happens. So we got the readings. Okay, tell us what's happening. The large particles have gone down by almost zero, and the small particles have gone from about 125 to three. So, so what this is, what you got here is just a little bitty picture of something that people will tell you can't happen. Um, the filter industry, as I said, is 
pretty unique in that it's non-regulated. So they'll sell you anything and tell you anything. Uh, I found this guy at 40 years in the industry. His name's Scott Sanders. And about 30 years ago, he, he went on a mission to figure out how to solve the problem of TB. So at the end of this, we come up with this filter media that works on really low flow systems. You can put it on board a ship and you can change that air quality. Another thing that we hadn't really talked about, but that molecule, if you spray all the walls and ceilings on a ship, as air moves into it, if it's got biology in it, it's cleaning it. So we've got a nice study that was done at, in the thoracic portion of Ohio State over a 30 month period. And I, it's the first time I saw it. They weren't swabbing surfaces. They were doing air samples. And for 30 months, the air remained pristine in terms of fungus. It was almost none in the air. And that, that was run out of Ohio State with uh, uh, Dr. White and Aegis. But they would come in every few months and reassess post-remediation. Um, so this will clean air also. Um, we think that in the maritime industry for mold, it's a great fit. But I would venture to tell you that I think of it, I only get so excited about mold. Uh, when you can take care of somebody, keep them alive, make their life better, it's a, it's, a, it's a big deal. Asthmatics, there's a lot of people that get impacted. Has anybody got any questions? So the question is basically, how often do you need to reapply it? The label says 90 days. That's not accurate. We have, you have to have a timeline on it for the EPA. And I can go back in and change that at virtually any time. The only time it comes off is with friction. And it's substantial friction. It's not um, like washing your hands. and No, it's not taking it off. It's real friction. I've never had a surface that hasn't lasted 90 days. And if I have a surface like a wall or a ceiling, it's years. And, and on your skin, since you're constantly shedding skin, so how do you stay on your hands? It, no, no, you would, we reapply once a day. So if you can get a guy to put it on like once a day, which isn't too hard. So most people will wash your hands once a day or you can get it. It's like, in a hospital, they want people reapplying hand sanitizer every time you go into a room and out of a room and anytime you have contact. Well, if you actually did that with that alcohol-based hand sanitizer, within 24 hours, your hands start to crack and bleed. At day two, you're crying. You're trying to put that stuff, you're crying. So if you actually go into a hospital and watch, and I've, we've, we've done this before, uh, they are nowhere near any level of the compliance that they've set. Um, so the, this, the, the coming off of the molecule doesn't happen. Uh, what we do do is we can actually put a dye in it. So you can walk into a vessel with a black light. It costs a little bit more because it's a new piece, but you can turn the lights out, and if you see color, you can physically see it on the wall. So the first time I applied it, I, I did it at the house and um, I, got, I got in a lot of trouble for this. <laughs> My wife really blistered me because uh, she is a king, she's a sergeant of us all and runs the house. And uh, I sprayed it in the bathroom. And then um, you can go in there with the black light today and you still see it on the walls and you can see where it ran down the walls. And I was just, it's a, and it, it, she'll go in there periodically and see what you've done. It's not even, it's, yeah, it's still there, dear. It's, it's working. And, but it's nonetheless, it's uh, what I would tell you is that this product, when I normally do a doctor's office, what we do is I walk in, I take the 
room that gets used the most. And we treat that room. And then I take the room that's next used the most and we compare it. So I come in every day at the end of the day, at the end of the cleaning cycle, and they're cleaning every day. And we'll pick three or four touch points and we'll swab them. And the room that isn't cleaned, ours, is always cleaner. And that goes back to the shedding process. And the fact that this is you basically, whatever that touch point is, is self-cleaning. That biology is being reduced, being reduced, being reduced. And I come in at the end of the day because, well, I know how it works. I'm not going to, if you're sitting there and I come up and swab right in front of you and it's treated and you've been touching it, I'll get a good number. And I know that because in the hospital, when we come into the emergency room and it's full and we're doing swabs, our counts went way up. And then a month later, we come back in, we do the same swab and the same thing and the counts way low. It's about that proximity in terms of how much shedding, and it takes a while to reduce that bio load. But the, how we do it is we'll take it out five days, and at the end of five days, you're just going, holy cow, this room has not had anybody clean it, and it has been cleaner now for five days. And I said, so maybe we've got some savings that we can work with in terms of cleaning. And that's how we do it. I can normally come in and cut their cleaning bill in half, make everything substantially cleaner. They are extremely happy because somebody's going on a vacation that they didn't have the money for before. And, but, but the key is, I think when you go back to that underway, how much time do people have to clean underway? Now, when you're in the Navy, you got the Marines to do the cleaning. So you don't care. But, on a, on a maritime ship, everybody's got, and they're working normally 18 hours a day while they're underway. They've got a lot, they don't have this massive amount of do downtime where they're playing Donkey Kong. They're functioning and working. And if they're not working, they're in a, a training piece, which is working for as to improve themselves to, to kind of move up. So that cleaning savings is a big deal. When I do that doctor's office, do the ceiling, do the walls, don't do them again for years. I do the floor. I redo the touch points. Yeah. And that's it. So for sinks, we can treat. And uh, we actually, we have a separate disinfectant that I run down the drains. And it's a, it was made by the government, so you know it works. Um, it was used, it's used for chem bio warfare. It will denature chemical chemicals and it will, um, it, it, the label says it takes off biofilms. It'll pull scale off. So probably once a month, if you're, if you're an infection control geek like me, you'll read about somebody being infected in a hospital room tied to a drain. You know, it's, it, if you get a drip on the drain, it brings it out. Yes, sir. The, the beauty of this is, is there are no options for low flow systems other than this. Nothing works. Go ahead. Now, the brake system defunking the uh, drains, great idea. If you were to pour that down into the black water system where all the solids go, um, it just killed your um, septic system, if you will. Right. Because you have a, a biological 
So the apparatus that actually treats and then we discharge on its own. So the same thing happens when you're doing that uh, at sea at, at a septic in, in the in the home. You know, if you've got one in your backyard, um, the piece that goes in, uh, we normally uh, we'll normally clean those pipes just before the the septic guys come out and rework it. <laughs> Once we've done that, we take that bioprotect molecule and run it down in there to keep it protected over time. So it won't leach any further than where you put it? No. Okay. So uh, it's, it's a kinetic kill. It's not a poison. So it, it, if it breaks off, it's just a particle that goes into the thing like a small piece of wood. <laughs> 